Hey tea heads, this is Don from Mayleaf. In front of me, I have four new Japanese green teas that have just arrived in. And of course, I want to taste them and approve them and make sure that they are ready for the Mayleaf shelves. But I wanted to take this opportunity to also discuss the importance of shading green teas during their growth cycle in order to manipulate and change the flavors. So let's introduce the four teas here. On my right here, we've got our latest Fukumushi. This is a Fukumushi Sakimidori. Sakimidori, so it's a new cultivar for us. Fukumushi means deep steamed and Fukumushi teas will always have this very trademark look about them where they look much more fine, more broken because the deep steaming will always make the um, leaves more fragile so that when they're rolled, they'll break more. So that makes them a bit more difficult to brew, but you get incredible flavor and incredible color out of those teas, those Fukumushi teas. Fukumushi tea uh, was invented or the process of the deep steaming was created to try to offset some of the astringency that happens when you are growing teas uh, in areas where there's a plateau, so it's a flatter land and therefore you have more all day sun and that can bring about more astringency. The reason for that is because of the fact that when you have a lot of sun, the plant has to produce lots of antioxidants. Those antioxidants act as a sunscreen. There are um, various different antioxidants in green tea, but catechins is the main one and catechins has a very bitter and astringent quality to it. And so if you are growing teas in places where there's a lot of sun, then you're going to get more catechins, which means it's going to be more likely for the tea to be more bitter and more astringent. And so what some of the producers worked out is if they steam the tea for longer periods of time than the standard steaming process, they soften and smoothen out that astringency. So this is our Fukumushi Sakimidori. This is from Kagoshima, southern tip of Japan where the teas just generally are much more gentle and rounded. And because it's close to the coast, somehow has a little bit more of a coastal sort of sea salty kind of quality to it. Anyway, we're gonna to get to that. Hopefully it tastes as good as the sample. Right, next up, we've got a Kabuse Okumidori. So this is a Kabusecha. And a Kabusecha basically means that they've taken the plant, they've grown it as normal, but before picking, a few days, five days, 10 days before picking, they'll cover the actual bushes with cloth and that will obviously shade it from the sun. Um, and so this is a Kabusecha, it's from the Okumidori uh, variety and it's also from Kagoshima. So both of these are from Kagoshima. Next up here, you've got another Kabusecha. This is from Shiga, this is a Kabusecha Saekari. So different cultivar, different area and but it's also a Kabusecha and I think it's been shaded for a longer period of time. So the length of time that that cloth was uh, draped over the bushes was 10 days. So a longer shading period. And finally here we've got our Gyokuro Okumidori. So this has been shaded not by covering with cloth but actually there's a scaffolding that's built around the plants and they they lay layers of uh, shading. It can be various different types of shading from you know different uh, thicknesses, different materials. So you can really control the amount of sun that you're taking away from the plant, and it can go up to 90% reduction. And this was shade grown for three weeks. So fully shade grown under Gyukuro Dan, which is these scaffoldings. And these two are kabuseches, which have been cloth shaded, and this has been unshaded. And you can see immediately that the difference that the shading makes to the color. Okay, I'm gonna state from the outset and I'm not going to repeat it. Of course, there are different cultivars, different areas and different producers um, here. So you're gonna have variations that come from all of those things. But I do think that there's gonna be a trend that we're gonna see during our tasting um, with shading and certainly you can see a trend with color. Much more green, the unshaded, all the way to a very, very deep beautiful, glossy, deep color. So you can see unshaded and fully shaded next to each other. Much more green um, compared to this one here where you're getting a lot more of a 
dark look about it. And we'll see how they look when they have been brewed. So let's talk about the theory of shading before we get stuck into the tasting. So the two chemicals that are key here in this discussion are theanine and catechins. Catechins we talked about, they're antioxidants. Theanine contribute to the growth of the plant amongst other things. So when a plant grows, it uh, it produces theanine. Theanine stimulates more growth. And once the plant has grown enough, then the theanine starts to get converted into catechins. Why does it get converted into catechins? Well, as I said before, catechins act as a sort of protection, especially a protection from the sun. So protection from uh, sort of a sunscreen in effect. And so once the, the plant has reached a certain height and, and is is growing leaves, those young leaves will start to develop catechins. So the theanine will get converted into catechins because now the little delicate leaves need to be protected from the sun. And so you get a shift of flavor from theanine to catechins. Theanine uh, is very brothy. It contributes to the umami quality of tea. Um, it's uh, basically a glutamate, so it has that savory to sweet quality. It also is very uh, uh, good for your body, it helps to boost dopamine, so it helps you to feel good. It has a wealth of health benefits. If you want to know about the health benefits of the different chemicals in tea, I'll put a link in the description below that will give you some ideas. But theanine essentially has a very particular taste and a very particular meditative sort of quality about the sensation that it has on the body. Catechins, on the other hand, are bracing, are bright, have an astringency to them, have a bitterness about them. Um, but don't let that put you off because of course, tea needs that bitterness. You know, any tea that doesn't have that bitterness is weak, is empty. Um, but you don't want too much, of course. Um, However, if you're looking at the health benefits of tea, then of course we always hear about antioxidants, antioxidants, antioxidants. I'm not gonna get involved in the minutiae of detail about antioxidant mechanisms, but essentially having a, a, um, a diet rich in antioxidants is considered to be good for you. Um, and so if you want to brew your tea specifically only for health benefits, then you'd brew it strong and you'd brew it bitter. But of course, my approach is brew for taste, that way you'll enjoy it and you'll drink a lot more of it and you'll be getting all of the, the health benefits as a secondary uh, effect of enjoying your drinking. But the catechins are there to protect the plant from the sun and when we drink them, they have a bright, astringent quality to them and have a slight bitterness to them. Um, and they're obviously very good for us. So theanine and catechins. So obviously, as we shade the plant, what we're doing is protecting the uh, conversion of the theanine to the catechins because the plant doesn't need sunscreen. It's got no sun, it's being shaded. And so it's saying, hold on to your theanine. We need to keep growing. We need to keep growing because we've got to find sun. And so what you are doing is protecting the theanine and boosting the theanine in the uh, leaves um, and reducing the catechin content. Of course, there's still catechins in it. You're still gonna get antioxidant effects, but it's gonna be less in the shade grown compared to the unshade grown. And the converse of that is that you're gonna get more theanine in the shade grown compared to the unshade grown. And so in terms of taste, you're gonna be getting more umami and more brothy compared to brighter and more verdant. Um, and you're gonna be getting more of the sort of meditative feel good effects from the shading compared with the more energizing effects of the unshade grown. Okay, I hope that's given you enough theory. I've got five grams of each tea and I would be brewing normally in my tokoname clay here, but because I want to try to make things even to do this as a, as a good, uh, side-by-side -side tasting, I am going to be just brewing in 100 mil guy ones. And I'm going to be um, brewing five grams in 100 mil. And I'm going to be brewing all with the same temperature water, 70 degrees. So we're keeping everything standardized. Now, every tea have their own sort of particular brewing guidelines that I would recommend. So you can go check them out in the website. But overall, 70 degrees, five grams is going to be okay as a standard for us to compare these teas. 
And I am obviously very excited to try all these teas. They've just come in. So we're going to put in our Fukumushi, our Kabuse Okumidori, which I think is less shade grown than our Kabuse Sayakari. Uh, yep, Sayakari, so I'm getting confused here. And finally, we've got our Gyokuro Okumidori from Shizuoka. Now, let me just tidy this up a little bit. Okay, let's get our nose into the Fukumushi. So everything I've just said to you about being brighter and more green uh, may give you the impression that I'm, I'm going to give you flavor notes that are very, very verdant. And I want to say from the outset that I never pick green teas that are too grassy or too green because I don't think that that uh, signifies a high quality green tea. What signifies a high quality green tea is that it has been processed in a way to bring about its warmth and its sort of nutritious quality. Um, so, oh, straight up my nose, that's the problem with Fukumushi. Um, okay, I'm getting lots and lots of like cherry pie. Um, so fruity, starchy, cereal. I'm getting um, some taro. Um, a slight little bit of broth in there. So it's still got that brothiness. All Japanese tea should have some brothiness. But the predominance I would say would be cherry tart, cherry cakes and cereals and a little bit of the starch of like a taro and some broth. Okay, now let's dive into the okumidori. So immediately deeper steamed buttered daikons. Um, sweet as well. Similar to the cherry, maybe more cherry blossom, so sakura. Again, you can see the difference here between the two, right? I'm picking up sweet notes like white chocolate. So white chocolate, cherry blossom, daikon. Compare these two here, so you can see the difference between two kabusechas. Super buttery, super buttery. So like buttered mashed potato, buttered uh, steamed daikon. So again, taking this, starchiness and amping it up, creamier, buttery. Oh. Um, yes, there is a savory note here, but, and you could throw it under the brothy note, but, but there's also some really beautiful bright notes like raspberry jam and again, Sakura Blossom. And finally, the granddaddy, the, the Gyokuro here. Um, whole wheat cereal. Um, it actually smells just as brothy as this one, even though this has had three weeks. But there's a certain, um, yeah, like malted whole wheat cereal quality to it as well. But again, I'm getting some of the starchy notes and some of the, uh, yeah, some of the um, starch notes of this, of, of the others, but maybe even sweeter, like sweet corn. Uh, so buttered sweet corn and a touch of touch of spice, which I always associate with um, paprika, but I always imagine paprika sprinkled over fresh ricotta cheese. So it's got that creamy uh, quality with that little piquancy. Um, these are all messed up, so I'm just going to put them over here. Doesn't matter. All right, I'm just going to brew them straight. 
I'll smell the wet leaf as I go, but I'm just gonna brew them straight. I find with, with, uh, with Japanese teas, I like to just brew them straight up without rinsing them. And I'm gonna pour them in here. Now we're gonna be using these filters for, especially for the fukumushi, it's gonna need it. This is a little bit of a mess, but we will try to make it work. And I'm gonna try and count 10 seconds in my head fast 10 seconds, like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. before I pour. And we will get as close as we can to there or thereabouts a similar brew. As I said, each tea will have its own particular brewing guidelines. Um, so I'm not saying this is the best way to brew these teas, but you know, it's good for us if we're doing a back-to-back -back, for us to be able to brew them in relatively a similar way. So if you are going to be brewing fukumushi, you need to either get a kyusu, which is really suited for fukumushi, or get one of these uh, basket brewers because there's a lot of uh, broken leaf here. Eight, nine, ten. Move on to this one. One, two, three, four. And you're going to see the difference in the color of the liquor. And that's another sign, or you'll be able to tell the difference that the shade growing makes to the color of the liquor. As you shade grow and you've got more theanine and less catechins, <clears throat> you're gonna get a paler tea. I'm gonna just move this one across. So we've got all clear brews here. Right, so slightly different brewing parameters, but there or thereabouts similar. And immediately we can see, she get every single drop of this gyukura out, but I'm in a bit of a rush, so I'm not gonna do that. Let me sure I put these down properly. And we'll look at those leaves a bit later. But take a look here at these liquors and how different they are in terms of colors. Because it is quite remarkable. They are all luminous and vibrant. But maybe that camera is the best one over there to pick it up. You can see from a very, very luminous, bright, sort of lime green. I mean, does it get more incredibly vibrant than that? It is incredible, the Fukumushis. And you can see the two Kabusechas, this one is a little bit more green than this one here. And then finally, the Gyokuro, look at that milky jade color. Incredible. And that's, again, a sign of how shaded it is. So if you see teas which look extremely green or, you know, more of this sort of luminous um, lime green, it's less likely to be shade grown. But when you start to move to the more pastel lemon color, all the way to this extremely light color here, then you can see that it's been shaded. I hope you can pick that up in the camera. All right, let's give these a taste. Oh, the hit of a Japanese green tea is like no other tea experience. Um, brothy. So again, I will never pick a tea which is not brothy, a Japanese green tea. It's not bitter. Slight touch at the back, but everything that you would want from Fukumushi. It's zingy on the tongue, tingly, bright. Uh, um, yeah, it's very physical. Uh, not in an astringent, uh, is not in an astringent way necessarily. Although there's a little bit of astringency, it's this tingle to juiciness. I'm picking up uh, yuzu and cannabis as that 
spicy, lemony quality. But I'm also picking up the warmth of porridge and I'm picking up sakura blossoms. Very balanced. I'm getting floral, I'm getting cherry fruit, I'm getting starchiness from oat porridge, and then I'm getting this cannabis and yuzu twang, which is really bright and uplifting. All right, moving on to the okumidori. Shade grown. Noticeably brothier. What do I mean? I mean texturally thicker, and I mean more savory to sweet. So, um, okay, so I'm still getting some porridge, but then imagine that porridge is more savory. Imagine that it's like um, a porridge made with oats possibly or rice, and then you've, you've put some daikon, so steamed radishes, a little bit of celery top in there. So it's got more of a vegetal quality. But it also has a fruity, light sweetness. I would associate it with nashi pears, Asian pears. So it has definitely moved into a, a, the territory of thicker, more brothy, a little bit more savory, um, less of the, the yuzu and cannabis twang of this one here, and uh, a little bit more fruit coming through. All right, the Kabusecha from Shiga. Now we've moved into creamy brothy, extremely buttery. It's like buttered mashed potatoes or um, buttered, yeah, mashed taro. Extremely, extremely buttery. Very, very quite milky as well. Reminds me of melon milk. So melon milk, papaya milk. So I'm getting the fruits, I'm getting the milkiness, I'm getting the creaminess, I'm getting the starchiness. Even less of the, uh, at least when it first, when you're first tasting it directly, because the aftertaste is different, because that transforms to a lemony quality at the end. But the taste of it is much less of that fresh twang that you were getting from the sakimi dori. All right, and now the gyokuro. Like jelly in my mouth, it is so, so, so thick. Taste. It reminds me of a really homely broth like vegetable broth. You've taken marrow and taro and all of these starchy vegetables, but not uh, too thick like marrow or green marrow, you know, or daikon, but very, very pure, slow cooked broth made with it. It's extremely brothy, extremely um, starchy rounded and jellied. All right, let's give them another round of tasting. Now that I've tasted all of them, we can pick up a little bit more and then we'll take a look at the leaves and smell the empty gong dao bays. But a noticeable difference in terms of texture from the medium to medium thick through to the thick through to the insanely jellied um, and certainly a difference in flavor profile from rounded, but with a little, you know, elements of, of um, well, let's see. Mm. Lots of that cherry coming through. Cherry and, um, oh, it's gotten sweeter. Yeah. I'm like getting cherry shortbread, but noticeable astringency, noticeable added bitterness, noticeable brightness, noticeable pulling, and more of that yuzu. Um, less of the cannabis, but more of the yuzu coming through in the taste. New one for us, this one, and I really love the in-between that it, it provides. It thickens up 
as I said before, it's got a, a, almost a chocolatey quality to it, but white chocolate. So it's still bright, it's still light. It's moving into that creamy, buttery and milky, but it's not quite there. It's yet yeah, chocolate, cherry blossom, um, and the aftertaste is great. Very, very juicy. Juicy. I have to come back to what that juiciness is. But it has a certain spice to it. Cherries there. Um, so in the mouth, it has almost a touch of like a roasted quality to it, but just it's so subtle, but it's there, a warmth to it, which is really lovely, a rounded quality. And the aftertaste is cherry and a spice, maybe caraway. Very, very sweet. The Kabusi Saikari. This one we have had before. And this is just straight up butter, butteriness, incredibly buttery tea. Um, very smooth. So the, the astringency moves uh, down. So the most astringent, less astringent, etc. But when I say the most astringent, please let me just state the astringency on this is beautifully poised. It is so subtle still but you notice that it reduces even further. Steamed rice, pandan leaves, lotus leaves. Moving into that, yeah, just creamier, starchier note. Hmm. Like you've taken a vegetable broth and you've cooked it down for a long period of time so it becomes so reduced that it becomes thick and jellied in the mouth. But then the transformation to this incredible limoncello, um, sweet lemony finish. Right, let's pour these away. We'll put them into the cup and I'll quickly smell the gong da bays and then we'll look at the leaves. So, these are all going to be sweet. Wow. Um, cherry taffy candy. Wow. Cherry taffy candy. Um, it has a cooling note on the nose as well. Reminds me of uh, those glucose tablets that you have. I haven't had it for a while, but you know, dextrose or glucose tablets. When you put it in the mouth, it's very sweet. It's very straight ahead glucose, but it has a cooling quality. Um, and sponge cake. Oh, different, different. Um, meringue, soft French meringues and some oxidized apple or candy apple. Ah, uh, um, very different again. In fact, on the smell of the empty gondabe, it's amazing the difference. Um, cake. I think I, my recollection is I wrote cake frosting previously, in previous years. I would say it's, it is cake frosting, but with that sponge cake as well. And finally, oh, Caramel custard, if that makes sense. Caramel custard with some preserved lemons, uh, preserved lemon or lemon, um, lemon curd, lemon curd, caramel custard. All beautiful, all sweet, incredible, but very different. Very, very different. And this one has the most cherry note coming through. Okay, let's put these aside. Do, do not worry, I will have obviously be brewing through these. We'll put them to the back here. Quick sip. Mm -hmm. Fukumushi. I'm really interested in this one. It has a slight 
roasty note to it. And that's why I associate a little bit with the chocolate, the white chocolate note, just a little bit of um, heat coming in there. Um, the two cabosetches you can see look very, very similar here, but let's compare them. Let's see if I can do this. So the Fukumushi you can see is gonna be the most mulched up because of the deep steaming, but you can see the difference here between the, uh, the two. The difference between these two is less obvious now that they've been um, open, but you can see this one is whole leaf compared to this one a bit more broken and this one still has a bit more of a, a deep forest green quality to it. And the most foresty green is always gonna be the Gyokuro. So there you go, shade grown Japanese teas. Well, three of them shade grown, one of them unshade grown and the difference that shading makes to the experience of your tea. These are all in stock, they're all spectacular. I'm very, very happy with our 2023 Japanese teas. Uh, this year has been a particularly great harvest, I think. Um, and uh, I highly recommend that you try out a few of them so that you can see the difference that shade makes. That's it, tea heads. Check out our other videos, Taste Our Teas, wherever you are in the world by browsing mayleaf.com and come visit us if you're ever in London. Other than that, I'm Don from Mayleaf. Thank you for being part of the revelation of true tea. Stay away from those tea bags. Keep drinking the good stuff and spread the word because nobody deserves bad tea. Bye.